Good evening. This is a special meeting of the school board um, on May 3rd, 2021. Uh, we'll have this meeting prior to our regular monthly meeting, but this special meeting is for uh, and inform some information which will be presented to us by the New Hampshire Retirement System and we are anxiously awaiting to hear. We're always interested in hearing. And um, prior to getting into that, I would just like to call the uh, task Ms. Cannon if she would call the roll to, for those who are in attendance. Certainly, Ms. Hastings. Here. Ms. Higgins. Ms. Higgins. Mr. Parker. Mr. Richards. Here. Ms. Smith. Here. Ms. Walsh. Here. Mr. Weinberg. Here. Ms. West. Here. And I'm here. Very good. Um, in addition, we have uh, the superintendent as well as uh, Mr. Dunn, and I believe I see Mr. Prince in the back. Um, and. Uh, Mr. Dunn, I'll allow you to introduce our uh, our guests this evening. Sure. Thank you. Tonight we have uh, New Hampshire some representatives from New Hampshire Retirement to give you an update on uh, the status of New Hampshire Retirement and where they may see things going. So tonight we have Marty Carlin um, with who's uh, communications for. New Hampshire Retirement, and the new Executive Director, welcome from New Mexico, Jan Goodwin. And in the uh, chief seats is Tim Crutchfield, who's one of the attorneys for New Hampshire Retirement. So I will uh, facilitate their presentation for them, but uh, right now I will turn this over to... Thank you very much. Before we get started, I'd like to thank you all very much for your service to Concord's children. So we would prefer that our time here tonight be more of a conversation than a lecture. So please ask questions as they come up rather than wait until the end. And if we use any jargon or technical terms that make no sense, please stop us and have us translate them into English for you. Marty and I will be going back and forth during our presentation and we'll try to respond to all of your questions as they come up. The next slide, please. So we'll be covering a few things tonight. First, why the employer contribution rate is increasing. We'll also discuss the, our most recent actuarial experience study and how that has impacted the employer contribution rates. We'll also talk about what the employer contribution rates will be for the next two fiscal years. And we'll also be covering some common questions that employers have, and then we'll be summarizing that all with our key takeaways. Every year, um, NHRS's actuary assesses the fair market value of our assets, which are the investments, and our liabilities, which are the value of the benefits that our members have earned and that New Hampshire retirement system will be paying in the future. And we do that to calculate our funding status, which is the ratio of our assets over liabilities. So this is an integral step that our actuaries use to calculate the employer contributions rate as required by statute and consistent with the New Hampshire's constitution. In contrast, the employee, the member contribution rates are fixed in statute and, and do not change the way the employers do. The actuaries use the assumptions, that, which is what how they differ, how they expect the different factors that affect the valuation. And what they do is they use a very long time horizon. Most of us, when we plan, we look at five or 10 years. Actuaries look out 50 to 100 years. So that's the time period that they make their assumptions over. And so they use all these assumptions together to calculate what the value of our assets and our liabilities are. And th so that's how the annual valuation works. And then every, five years, they go back and do a very thorough examination of all of the assumptions that are factored into the annual valuation. 
they look back over a four-year period and see how each assumption that they made compared to what the actual experience of the plan was. So that's why they call that the experience study. And the, as you'll see later, the experience study that they did most recently made some big changes, and so that's why we had some changes in the upcoming employer contribution rate. And so Marty's gonna to talk to you a bit about the, the 2020 actual actuarial experience study. Thank you, Jan, and, and uh, again, for the record, my name is Marty Carlin, and thank you for having us uh, today to talk about this information. Um, so with the experience study, uh, what the actuary does is that, you know, they crunch all the numbers and they bring uh, recommended changes, if any, to the board of trustees who ultimately have the decision uh, to adopt that. There are two primary types of assumptions that they use, demographic and economic. Demographic are things such as how long are people going to live in retirement, what age are they going to retire at, what's, um, you know, just things like that. And economic is, is mainly, you know, how are the investments going to do, what's inflation look like on the longer term, and um, items like that. So what the board did this, uh, as a year ago this May, um, was accept the uh, experience study from our actuary GRS. And this study was um, commissioned and started in December of 19, so it was all pre-COVID when the, sort of the wheels began turning for this, uh, you know, and then, and then that hit. So the board accepted the demographic changes based on the experience study. Uh, would anybody mind if I um, take my mask off to breathe a little bit better? Thank you. Um, so, and, and Director Goodwin had mentioned, you know, in the statute, there's a minimum of five years between experience studies, but in um, 2019, the board uh, voted to go to a four-year rotation for experience studies just because of the way NHRS rates are set every two years. There'd be periods, and they have been in the past, where your assumptions are six years out of date, um, you know, depending on the rate cycle. So it's a, it was a four-year period looking between 2015 and 19. And, um, you know, p mortality improved in that point and some other demographic changes. And th those are pretty much, you know, the board leaves to the actuary, um, you know, what makes sense demographically. And then the economic assumptions, the actuary doesn't come down with stone tablets, you know, from, from the hill and say, this is what it shall be. What the actuaries do is they give you a range of reasonableness. What, what um, would be a reasonable expectation going, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30, 40 plus years uh, for economic uh, activity. So the board adopted uh, the following major changes. They reduced the wage inflation from three and a quarter percent of pay uh, to 2.75 uh, and 2.25 percent for teacher. And, and the reason that the wage, um, uh, primary reason that the wage inflation was reduced was because the price inflation went down as part of their experience as well. And this is a long-term uh, interest rate. So that was dropped from 2.5 to 2.0. And that's, that's sort of the basis of any wage uh, increases is the rate of inflation. Uh, they reduced the assumed rate of return. How much is, is ex can the retirement system reasonably expect to make um, you know, over over a long period, from seven and a quarter percent to six point seven five percent, and that was by far the biggest and most important um, cost-wise uh, change to the assumptions. And they also increased the medical subsidy margin for teachers um, from uh, uh, two basis points to, f to from twenty basis points to fifty. And what the medical subsidy is, if you're not familiar, and um, is it as a education plan, you may not be. Um, it, what it is, it's an insurance premium offset um, that if you have a retiree who's eligible and they're getting insurance from their former employer, NHRS um, pays a, a bit of an offset uh, at a statutory capped amount for those folks. Medical subsidy benefits were closed to active teachers uh, and they had to have retired by July 1st of 2009. So that's a, essentially a closed plan. Employees were closed out a couple of years earlier than that. Um, and the way that's funded is rather than having a pile of money to pay the subsidy, it's, it's funded on a solvency rate. So basically the actuary calculates how much over the next two years are they gonna need from employers to pay the benefits for that closed group. Uh, and they increase the margin a little bit because some people can jump on and off of the subsidy depending on other insurance options they have with uh, you know, families and things like that or other employment. So that even, even with that change to the medical subsidy margin, that rate still went down overall for all four of our member groups. 
So why did the board um, do what it did? Um, and this is important, um, just, just to, you, you may not be happy with the result and the cost, but I mean, there was a, a thorough process uh, outlined in the statute that led to these outcomes. Um, they looked at the experience over the past four years and the actuary found that it didn't really, the current assumptions didn't support the cost of the plan going forward. So, um, you know, the investment assumption, the mortality assumptions, things like that. And besides the actuary, the board also heard from economic investment managers, um, you know, and other outside experts on capital markets about what their projections were gonna be. So there was a lot of um, input from experts that went into that. And when they made those decisions, both to adopt the demographic and the, and the economic changes to the assumptions, they were acting in their fiduciary uh, capacity as trustees. They're required by law to um, work in the best by A, to uh, determine actuarial rates by sound actuarial valuation and practice, and to act solely in the best interests of the plan participants and beneficiaries. Uh, New Hampshire has a constitutional amendment, Article 36A, and it has three parts to it essentially. The first is to require rates to be set by sound actuarial practice. So numbers can't be pulled out of a hat or you know darts can't be thrown at the wall. It needs to have a, an actuarial basis that, that's reasonable. Um, that article also um, requires employers to play those, pay those contribution rates uh, in full in the year that they're assessed. And it also prevents the state or other actors from taking trust fund assets for other uses. Um, you know, such as you know, speeding up the widening of 93 or anything like that. So once the money's in the trust, it's there for the beneficiary. So uh, they were following Article 36A and the statutory framework for um, developing rates and conducting the experience studies when they made these decisions last year. And I'll turn it back over to Jim to kind of walk you through some of the pieces in the rate. Obviously, there's a bottom line, which is the bold, but there's, there's different components to that. Thank you, Marty. So now we're getting to some real actuarial terms. So the second column over from for the left is it's normal cost. The normal cost is the percent of pay, the, the salary that the different plan members are getting, that the retirement benefit actually costs. And the pension unfunded actuar the UAAL, that stands for Unfunded Actuarial Accrued Liability. And that's the difference between the plan assets that we currently have and the value of the benefits that all of our members have earned. Right now, that unfunded liability stands at $6 billion. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, the unfunded liability, the UAAL, is $6 billion. But could you describe what it is again? I'm sorry. It's, it's the difference between the value of our assets compared to the li the, the, our liabilities, which are the value of the benefits that our members have earned. So in an ideal world, which is hopefully where we'll be in about 18 years, the normal cost is, will be the contribution, the total contribution rate that we need to receive from the members and the employers. But because we have a significant unfunded liability, we have to get that paid down first before we can have lower contribution rates. We're very fortunate here and Marty can tell you all the gory details because he was here when it happened. Um, the, the legislature realized that we've got an unfunded liability that's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And unless we take some concrete steps, it's going to get out of control. Fortunately, the legislature decided to pay down this unfunded liability over 30 years, just like your home mortgage. And just like your home mortgage, the payments in the first several years are largely dedicated to interest on that liability. At NHRS, we're about at that tipping point where we're going to pay less down each year in interest and more in principal. So that 
that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But we realize that the employer contribution rate, because of the changes from the actuarial study, those are going to have to go up in the next two year cycle. So you can, as you can see from this chart, the normal cost is paid by both the employer as well as the member. And our members pay a substantial proportion of the total contribution rates. And when you look at what the employers are paying, a substantial proportion of what they are paying as the employer contribution rate is because of that unfunded liability. And so Marty's gonna to talk to you a bit now about the medical subsidy. Thank you, Jan. So yeah, as I mentioned, the medical subsidy is a, it's a premium offset um, that's, that's capped as an amount and that's funded as a pay as you go basis through the employer contribution rate. So I think the, for the teachers, I think it was in the high, closer to 2% this current year and it's going down to 1.54 with the changes. And that's basically as met folks who are eligible for the medical subsidy and receiving that benefit age into Medicare eligibility, the, the, the premium amount goes down because Medicare is their primary insurance and they may be picking up a supplemental plan through their former employer. So ultimately that medical subsidy number is going to fade away over the decades as, uh, as a membership ages into Medicaid and then passes away ultimately. So, so that, that that's, you know, that, that's just sort of, there's gonna be a long tail on that, but um, that, that's how the medical subsidy works. Um, one thing that, that Jen uh, mentioned about some of the history, and I, I, I suspect some of you may be wondering, um, you know, if, if we have a constitutional amendment that requires sound uh, contribution rates and it requires employers to pay that, you know, how did we end up with this liability? And, and there's, there's a, there's a it's a long story, but I'll try to keep it as tight as possible. And, and essentially, you know, it started with some bad decisions made 30 and even farther years ago that we're all paying for now as school board members, taxpayers, um, employers. And what happened was um, back in the early, uh, in the late 80s, uh, there were a couple of very strong market return years and the retirement system under the calculations at the time was well, over 100% funded. So all of the money for future benefits was, was in the bank. And the legislature um, in 1989 uh, and made some changes to the plan to improve benefits for the different member groups. Um, you know, they were, they were even more modest than they are now. Um, and those changes, just the way the timing of valuations and the rate cycle, the cost of that wasn't gonna show up in the employer contribution rates until the early 90s. So, you know, the 89 valuation would be setting the 92 and 93 employer contribution rates. So between the time those legislative enactments came in and 1992, um, folks who were in New Hampshire at the time will remember, you know, there was a, a tremendous um, recession, a real estate bubble. A lot of the established state banks all went under that year um, you know, because of loans. So, so there, was, there was a pressing fiscal issue and there was pressure from employers and, and from others on lawmakers to do something about that. So, um, you know, and, and there was a percentage-wise a fairly significant employer contribution rate increase um, from 91 to 92. In terms of actual what the rates were, they were in the single digits, so uh, much lower than they were now, but still that, um, you know, we can't pay 25% more in rates, we're in a recession. And the legislature um, passed a law, basically. They did a couple of things in that law, House Bill 51. They uh, changed the way we calculated the liability. Um, there are, at the time, there were, I think, four actuarial methods that were allowed in, in terms of assessing your liabilities, and they chose one, the one that was the most favorable in terms of sort of hiding it, uh, if you will. Uh, and they also mandated that we kept our assumed rate of return high, uh, higher than the board would have liked to, um, again, keep the lower your assume rate of return, the more the unfunded goes up. So those were gonna be short-term solutions for a short-term problem in the early 90s. And that actuarial method stayed on the books until um, 2007 when it was finally repealed. And those didn't um, show up until the, the uh, 2010 rates. So essentially the employers were paying what they were asked to do. You know, so they were meeting their constitutional obligation, but you know, the underlying math wasn't what it could or would have should have been. 
So, um, you know, there was a leak in the boat and nobody looked at it. And this was kind of glossed over in the 90s because we had very strong investment returns, like most folks, you know, looking at, I think, double digits, you know, mid teens, eight, eight years out of nine um, throughout the 90s. So, you know, there was a sort of structural underfunding on the employer side. On top of that change, there was something uh, back then called the special account, uh, which was a, a law that took any, quote, excess investment income in a given year for that the retirement system received and, and put it aside into a separate account to pay things like cost of living adjustments, medical benefits, things like that. And, um, you know, what that means is if you have a good year, a lot of your gain, um, you know, is, is dedicated to something else. So when you have that bad year, you don't have any money to fill that hole. Um, so that went, started in the 80s, and, and again, that went on until it was repealed in, um, to, between 2007 and 2011. So those are these structural issues with funding, and they really didn't come home to roost until 2001-2. We had the dot-com recession, 9-11, um, you know, those issues. We had a couple of uh, negative years of investment performance, and people kind of woke up and said, what's going on here? And, you know, between different conversations among constituent groups, it took till 2007 for the legislature to fix those foundational issues, changing it to the actuarial method, actually setting a closed period to pay down the liability. So we didn't even really know what the liability was until, you know, until those changes were made. And again, you know, history lesson, what happened in 2007, the Great Recession. So basically they fixed all the foundational things and as soon as that happened, the economy just cratered. You know, our investments like everyone else's went down. So that just dug the hole even deeper. So those three things together, created the, the bulk of the liability that folks are paying off now. Um, since then, when the board has adjusted its assumption and lowered the assumed rate of return, uh, that has increased the liability, uh, you know, but arguably in a more sound fiscal way because you're taking in more money, you're not sort of having wishful thinking in the markets, you need to let the markets dictate what you think you can make out of it. So, so all of those things together is how we got to six billion. and. Five of that six billion is scheduled to be paid down by 2039, and what um, any future gains and losses, liabilities, um, are going to be paid off in 20-year layers uh, going forward. You know, 2041, 2043, 2045, and that's a recommendation uh, from a statutory commission that looked at the retirement system back in 2017. Mr. Dunn was actually on that committee as an employer representative, and they, it's called layered amortization, and that's something that will help prevent the number and the, the size of the liability from getting to where it is now ever again, um, you know, if the state can maintain its funding discipline. So I told you it was a long story. I hope it wasn't too long. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. It's an important story. So the question right now on every employer and every school board member's mind is why did the employer contribution rates go up so much for this next two-year period compared to the prior two-year period. It's on average about 20% over the different plan groups. So we have to go back to the valuation and the underlying assumptions. As Marty mentioned earlier, the big change in the CPI, the, the inflation rate that's going from 2.5% to 2% drove the change in the assumed rate of return for the investments, going from 7.25% to 6.75%. And as Marty said, when you lower the assumed rate, the present value of the unfunded liability increases. And we also, in the last experience study, adopted new mortality assumptions. Um, early in 2019, this Ta mortality table that the actuaries have been talking about for years finally came to fruition. It was a mortality table based only on public employees. Before then, it had been based on general members of the public. And I'm sure many of you know, as school board members, teachers are one of the longest lived um, professional groups. And so by having a mortality table that better reflects our members, the actuaries were able to come up with better recommendations to the board on what the mortality rate should be. And as Marty said, there's going to be a reduction in the payroll growth factor. 
That's partly due to the, the lower expectations for future inflation and as well as for teachers where we're expecting declining numbers of teachers in the future because of, of the lower number of school aged children. So that's why the rates change so much. And there were a couple of other um, factors that played a role. In 2019, the legislature passed a one-time cost of living adjustment, a COLA, that many of our retirees were eligible for. But as part of that legislation, the legislature said that that cost of the COLA, the cost of living adjustment had to be paid by the employers. So no more, you know, bad behavior from the 90s, you know, they, as they determined that this COLA was going to be paid for by the employers rather than just added to the unfunded liability. And then as Marty also mentioned earlier, the layered amortization um, did have a small impact and helped reduce the employer contribution rates very, very slightly for this next two year cycle. And as you can see, um, you're all very familiar with that uptick that you're seeing for the new contribution rates going from the 2021 rates to the 22-23 rates. That's that 20% increase that you all are struggling to, to pay for in your budgets. And now back to Marty. Thank you, Jan. These are some questions. We, we've done this presentation, uh, folks from the retirement system for different school boards and town councils and, and professional groups around the state over the last few months. And these are some of the questions that they came up with. And some, some of them are based on some legislation that was introduced earlier this year, none of, none of which is still around. Um, you know, but can, can you just cut down the unfunded liability payment by getting rid of that 2039 date and just pushing it out into the future? And absolutely, there was actually a bill to move the amortization out an additional five years. And that the, the long-term cost, I mean, in the short term, employers would save next year on what they're paying. But in the long term, they'd be paying over a billion dollars more. Essentially, for every, under that proposal, every dollar not paid by an employer between now and 2039, they're going to be paying $2 back for every dollar between 2040 and 2044. So that, that was killed by the legislature. Um, and actually, that was actually opposed by our board of trustees as well on fiduciary grounds. It just wasn't, uh, they didn't believe it was sound. And they tend not to take a position on legislation, but they did on that one. Um, another one that's come up is, can you just, don't, you don't have to be 100% funded, do you? Not everybody is going to get their entire pension in one day. I know these are paid out on a monthly basis over the lifetime of a member. So if you don't have 100% of the assets in the bank, um, you know, why do you need that? And it's like, well, you know, if you're shooting for less than 100%, you're never going to get closer to 100%. Basically, you're, again, you're undercounting, you know, you're cheating, if you will, you know, by not doing that. So that just isn't sort of acceptable actuarially. Um, can less expensive assumptions be used? Uh, in other words, can you, can you just kind of boost the, the assume rate of return a little bit to save, save some money next year? And again, is that fiduciary duty and the constitutional obligation to have sound actuarial um, practice. So they couldn't really do that. So those three are more sort of process changing, you know, rewriting the rules. The last one here, can the state provide support? And you're probably all well familiar with that, is the state had traditionally paid 35% uh, of teacher retirement costs. Um, actually, I, I don't know when it started. I, in, in my research, before there was a New Hampshire retirement system, there was a separate plan for teachers. And back at least until the early 50s, which as far as our, our files go back, the state was paying 40% of the cost of retirement contributions you know, from, from the employers for teachers. Uh, and that carried over into NHRS when we were created in 1967. And then in 77, uh, the legislature reduced it to 35%. It also added uh, that contribution for local police and fire costs as well. And that was on the books for 30 plus years until it was repealed in 2011. So besides the rate increases you've seen because of sort of catching up on the sins of the past, you're also paying 50% more than you had been, you know, when the state was subsidizing, you know, 35% of the cost back then. There's been bills in recent years, uh, they haven't uh, advanced through both houses. Um, one came close, but, um, you know, and there was a couple of, couple of pieces to put in a 5% or a 15% contribution this year for locals, but both of those died uh, in the Senate. 
So, so those are some of the questions. I'm sure you guys have some as well. So, you know, we'd be glad to add some to this list. Go ahead, Pam. Um, I think one of the concerns is sort of the big jumps. And is there any ideas, approaches, plans to smooth the payment back so that we can plan ahead to invest in our schools and our kids? I mean, most of the tax increase in, for this district this year will be going to the reti to, to retirement costs. Um, so, you know, if we had a better way of figuring this out for a long-term, pr more predictable solution. And I'll see what I can add. Okay. Um, you know, and that, that increase was driven by those changes to assumptions. So, so to the extent that that six and three quarters is a reasonable investment assumption going forward, and we and you know that that's proven out, you know, over the next few years, um, you know, if there isn't another change like that, that the rate percentages now would be expected to remain stable. You know, there could be fluctuations pro or con, if investments are better than expected, that could push the rates down. Um, you know, there'll, there'll be demographic fluctuations, but to the extent that these assumptions, assumptions don't change very much four years from now, you're, you're definitely looking at sort of four years of this level rate, and um, you know, if we're hitting those assumptions, it's probably closer to 10 years of where we're at right now. And with, with um, talk, you mentioned smoothing, and it's not exactly the same thing, but one thing that we and other plans do is with investment returns, we don't base the, the, the next set of rates on the most recent, we average the, a five-year rolling average of investment returns to kind of smooth out those peaks and valleys um, in, in the investments to kind of try to bring some cost stability. Hope that answered. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that. And we also smooth the value of the investments over a five-year period. So when we calculate the unfunded liability, it's based on the five-year average of the value of the investment portfolio. So just to follow up since you said it goes, when's the last time they went down? Um, other than for teachers, um, the 20, uh, 20, 21 rates went down from 1819 for, for employees, police, and fire by a little bit. And, but teachers are our biggest. Teacher, yeah, absolutely, cost. and that's that the declining population that Jan talked to. The, the you know the even you know the, the the pool of active workers is less, and that that's put more pressure on the teacher plan. They've seen the largest arc of a rate increase of all the four groups because of that. Ms. Cannon, go ahead, Dina. So. I guess one of my questions, because I follow investments pretty closely, is what is your annualized rate of return? Because if you look at like S&P index funds, the 10-year the rate of return on S&P index funds is 13%. It's not 6.75, it's, it's double that. Five years is 18%. Um, last year was, it, despite COVID, last year was 16%. Where did the 6.25% 6, 6 come from? Okay, the 6.75 is a forward-looking estimate. And I've, you've probably also heard some investment professionals say that today's high returns are borrowing from tomorrow's returns, because we've been having very high returns in the last close to 18 months at this point. And when you look at the entire NHRS investment portfolio, we have more than just S&P 500 stocks I, in there. I, right, I just picked right, right, one thing right. to compare. And typically, the expected return for public equity, so the S&P 500, tends to be higher than a lot of other assets that we can invest in. But in the interest of having a well-diversified portfolio, which is one of the responsibilities of the board as fiduciaries. Yeah, we, diversify. We, we have to diversify. And so, you know, the general thought is, is that when stocks are doing well, bonds won't be doing well. And right now, the bond return rates are very low. They're terrible, which is why people who do investing are getting out of bonds, which lowers the rate even further. Right, but we do need to maintain a diversified portfolio so that for the t because we need it for liquidity as well as to ensure a stable rate of return over time.
because when you look at the longer term performance of the stocks, even the large company stocks, it's up and down. And if we were to have all of our portfolio in the S&P 500, that would be a very dangerous place to be because it's just so erratic. Right. No, I just picked the S&P index as, as one indicator, but I, I just, the, the rate of return of 6.75, I think is, is not necessarily um, going to be what it, what it ends up going into the future. I think that's an underestimation. And the problem is that that's coming off the back of the taxpayers, right. who for the most part don't have the ability to invest. Right. <laughs> right. And, and so the, the way the actuaries came up with that recommendation of 6.75, because they're actuaries, they're not investment experts. They consult with, I think it was 14 different investment managers to ask them, what do you think, how do you think stocks are going to perform over the next 10 or 15 years? How do you think U.S. stocks are going to perform? How are international stocks are going to perform? How do you think bonds are going to perform? How do you think real estate is going to perform? Every single asset class that we have. And then they did a weighted average based, based on our actual portfolio to come up with what our future expected returns are going to be. I understand what you're saying. I, I'm not happy with your actuarial people. I mean, I, I mean, I can't argue with what you're telling me, but I'm, my experience is that that is not an accurate indication of where we're headed. Well, I did disagree with them. Let's put it that way. Okay, then, <laughs> then we're going to have to agree to disagree we're on have that to one. Agree to disagree, but Jonathan. Just, for your presentation, I was wondering what concerns you have with the plan moving forward. I imagine there are some hesitancies, as with every plan. Well, I've got to say, compared to a lot of plans in the U.S. right now, New Hampshire is in much better shape. And that's because the legislature realized the mistakes that were made in the 80s and the 90s and, have t and has taken those positive corrective steps to pay off those mistakes that were made. And as painful as we know that these employer contribution rate increases are, the way I look at it is that the decision has been made to invest in tomorrow's teachers and public servants because by paying off this unfunded liability over the next 18 years, in the future, the contribution rates for both the members and the employers will just be able to be the normal cost. And that will be a significant savings for both the employers and the members. But we're now in the middle of the tough part of doing this. And once we get through these next 18 years, it's just going to be a whole lot easier. And it's maintaining the discipline right now when you're looking at a 20% increase in the teacher contribution rate, which is very difficult. We understand that. Did you want to add anything to that? Go ahead. Um, how does the returns of the New Hampshire retirement system um, compare to other systems, both in actual returns and estimated rate of return? Okay, um, for the most recent fiscal year, which ended June 30, 2020, our returns compared to other public pension plans with more than $1 billion in assets, we were in the top quartile. We got 1% loss, or 1.1%. And that was in the top? I, I, I'm sorry, that, that was over the 10 year period okay. and ended June 30, 2020. Okay. Yeah, yeah, last year was uh, in the body, you know, the trail. I mean, there were some state plans that had negative returns, like Maine did 1.8%. Um, you know, so, so 
the market has roared back since the, the heights of the height of the pandemic. But if you remember June 30th, it was just starting to, and most of the gains in the market have occurred, you know, in the last nine months. And in fact, through March 31st, those numbers that we just got um, recently from from the investments, we're looking at a 19% return, um, you know, over the fiscal year to date, and I think it's 30% over year over year, okay. 331 of 20. So, a, quite a broad swing, but um, you know, and in, in terms of peer as Jan said, we you know we were in the top quarter over the 10-year period, the last um, couple of years because the S&P did outperform so many other asset classes that did push us down. And I, actually, I did want to mention with the assume rate of return uh, conversation, the 6.75 that we the board adopted, the actuary said you should really go between 6.25 and 7, but we really wouldn't want you to go higher than 6.75. And the board had the discretion to work within that sort of that those those, those bumps that the actuary gave us and of all the plans that uh, Jan was talking about there's about 120 uh, large you know but some some states have multiple plans for the different groups so there's over 120 pension plans out there that are tracked uh, by a something on the call the pen, public pension database and all of, of the 127 I'll say about 100 and 16 of them have lowered their assumed rate of return at least once since 2016 so we're we're, we're not bucking any trends. Uh, this has been a, a, a constant since, since the Great Recession, and, and a lot of that has been driven by how low interest rates are. You can't make any money on, on fixed income investments anymore. You need them sort of as a floor, but you used to be able to make, you know, five, six percent, you know, just, just on fixed income, and that's that's hasn't come back. So that's one of the reasons that's driven the rates down for all plans. We are towards um, the lower end of assumptions, but not the lowest. Maine is also 6.75. Vermont just went down to seven. I'm not sure what Massachusetts did. I think from I think Rhode Island's under seven now. So it, again, we're, we're everything that's happened in New Hampshire, both with liabilities changes to the plan contributions. This is a, a national story with you know maybe a few different facts that are state specific. And there are some states, you know, again, Jan was talking about New Hampshire being in a good position and and there are states where they're still digging their hole the uh, the states still aren't putting in the full required contributions every year and the numbers are just getting bigger and scarier you think about new jersey and illinois you'd see in the news states like that kentucky's another one um so so you know that isn't happening here you know we've stopped fill, digging our hole and we're starting to fill it in and it is painful and it's hard work Other questions? I guess I'm going to ask a question that you may not be able to answer, and that's um, you explained how with mortality rates and all, what I look at that is that you're telling me that our costs are going up. The cost is going up. We're paying more and more because people are living longer. What's going to happen in another three or four years when we come to our next one? Because every, I mean, I know we're at, I know you're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but for many property owners, it looks like a train. It's not good these next few years, these next 10 years. You talk about being great in 18 or 19 years. Um, that could be some very significant property tax increases between now and then. So can you give us a prediction of what's going to happen or an a, educated guess? And as I said, I know that's a, a question you may not be able to answer. As far as mortality, I, I, New Hampshire adopted generational mortality probably about 10 years ago, and that's the most conservative assumption rate that there is for actuaries to use. Um, the change to the new pension table, pension mortality table based only on public employees, that's also very conservative, and those numbers only became available at the beginning of 2019. So at this point, I don't see anything else on the radar screen that would have a dramatic effect. But we will be revisiting you know, every you know, four to five years the experience study to see if any other tweaks need to be made. Sometimes there will be an experience study where no changes are made because we've already done all the hard work. And so we, we will just hope that that will be the, the, what we see when we do the next experience study. But we can't promise you that. 
And if you make, as you go back to your slide with the curves, so they just go up and up. Yeah. Well, there what are the odds? What are the odds of that purple one flattening out? Because it looks like it's pretty much gone consistently up. It's whether it's gone up a lot or just gone up a little. So you think, Mike? Looking right. at this, my guess would be that's going up. We are hoping that with this most recent experience study that we'll start to see things flatten out. And that's where it'll stay for a while. That is, that uh, our goal is to set rates that will be expected to stay for a while. It is not our intention to have the rates go up every two years. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So I think we've pretty much covered all of these takeaways. Unless you, and here's our contact information. If you have any follow-up questions, we'd be happy to answer them or come back at another time. Ms. Goodwin, Mr. Corlin, thank you very much for coming in and speaking with us and giving us this information. Um, Tough topic, but uh, we very much appreciate your insights and your your explanations, and um, and we hope to see you come back again. So, if we have additional questions, we can ask them. We're Does anybody have any last questions before? Okay, thank you. So, um, Mr. Dunn, is there anything else before we adjourn this meeting prior to our regular meeting? Okay, in that case, I would take uh, entertain a motion uh, to adjourn this special meeting. So moved. moved by Ms. Smith. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Walsh. All, the, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we're adjourned till the regular board meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.